I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. I'm Alan Carrasso. It's 9.05, Wednesday, September 2nd. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Third Red Daily News. We finally made it to Derby Week, even though it now seems like we're closer to next year's Derby than we were to this year's Derby when we started talking about it. I am Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I agree, it's a thrill after all these many long, arduous months to say, happy Kentucky Derby Week, everybody. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And I have to say, this is like waking up Christmas morning with a new puppy, walking downstairs, find out the Giants won the Super Bowl, and they have the number one draft pick. That's how exciting this week is for me. I'm Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN, and I, like eight of the Derby horses, am a 50 to 1 chance to make it through the weekend. <laughs> I've never seen John that excited. It's a little disturbing. Oh, oh it's, it's racing at its best. The Oaks, the Derby, and all the undercards. And we got a couple of big yearling sales coming up also. I mean, this is like, I'm like a kid in a candy store with like a $50 bill. This is unbelievable. Coming in hot. Coming in hot and ready. Appreciate the enthusiasm. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Reminder that the Keeneland September yearling sale starts September 13th, that's next Sunday, and runs through September 25th with 4,272 yearlings on offer. Also, Keeneland released a, an extensive list of jockey of protocols for COVID-19 for jockeys for the upcoming fall meet, which of course leads into the Breeders' Cup World Championships. So good job by Keeneland having those in place ahead of time. We saw some issues earlier in the year with different tracks that didn't quite have as stringent protocols for jockeys. So good on them for being proactive and getting out in front of that. And then of course, Keeneland September is something we all look forward to. We'll be here before you know it. So we had the Kentucky Derby draw yesterday. As everyone said, we are finally here at Derby Week. We have made it through the fog and we have the Run for the Roses to look forward to this Saturday. Um, we've talked in the past few weeks about how it's maybe not the most exciting derby of all time, but it nevertheless is the derby. And we finally made it after four months delay. Um, we had a big scratch yesterday with our collector. It was really unfortunate for me and my stable. We'll talk about that in a little bit. as We run down, you know, where we are after all the prep races, he had a minor foot bruise, uh, Sounds like something that won't keep him out too long. Hopefully he'll make it to the Preakness and or the Breeders' Cup. Tom Drury said it's just a minor thing and they had to do right by the horse. So good on them for doing that. Um, as it is, we have three horses in single digits on the morning line. Tis the Law was made the three to five morning line favorite. I'm sure he's going to be that short, maybe four to five, even money. Um, but they all drew next to each other on the far outside, which is an interesting little wrinkle. In the 16 hole, we have uh, Honor AP. And then 17 is Tis the Law, and 18 is Authentic. One of my first impressions, we're going to go around and we're going to talk about long shots. We like how we, you know, how we see the race uh, setting up. But one of, the, one of my first impressions was that it doesn't seem like there's a ton of speed in the race. And I think that's something that's pretty rare in the Derby. I think we usually have a couple of runoff speed types, whether it's, you know, sprinters who have recently stretched out or, you know, long shots whose only chance is to go to the front. I don't know that we have that this year. I think Authentic is probably going to be the most likely front runner with John Velasquez breaking from the outside. I think they have to be aggressive early on with him. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of stalking types, but I don't know that we're going to have a super fast speed duel, uh, which is unfortunate for me because some of the long shots that I do like are late running types and, you know, they need a little bit of a setup going into that final turn. Uh, Tizzle obviously is, is way the horse to beat. I think, you know, we're it's kind of obvious that if he runs back to his Travers, it's going to take a lot for someone to beat him. If he runs back to any of his other races before that, then I think he might be a bit of a vulnerable favorite. So I think that's kind of what it comes down to. And, you know, while I'm not running to the window to bet against him, I do think that they're, they're like I said, there's that one race and I don't generally like short price favorites that have one race that's better than everybody else. And then a bunch of other races that are good, but not necessarily head and shoulders above everybody else. Initial thoughts from the Derby, starting with Bill. 
Well, first of all, I want some of those John Green happy pills that he was taking this morning. I hate to be Scrooge here, but John, I'm not feeling it. Maybe this is something we could talk about. I mean, the thing was supposed to be run four months ago. We've got a three to five favorite. It's the second leg of the Triple Crown. There won't be anybody in the stands. Yeah, it's the Kentucky Derby, but I think to say that, you know, there's that same buzz out there for a normal year, I, unless it's just me and, you know, maybe I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. I'm sorry, I'm not feeling it. And you know my phone number. I definitely want some of that stuff, John, because, man, it did some real work on you. Um, Joe, I'd like to look at this from a betting standpoint. All of us like the bet on the horses. Um, I've been on the Tisla bandwagon since the champagne. Obviously, I'm not going to get off them now. But who wants to bet a three to five or four to five shot, especially in the Kentucky Derby? I think the way to approach the race is kind of look at the race within the race. The other 17 horses, if you assume that Tisla is going to win, what's going to happen among the other 17? And if you put those in the uh, into um, into the mix, it's not a stellar group by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it's a kind of a uh, riddle from a handicapping standpoint. And as long as uh, Honor AP or Authentic don't run second, I think from the exact is you've got a chance to get some sort of strange horses in there to maybe make a little bit of a nice price. I mean, I, I think everybody kind of falls into three categories. Um, the, the, the horses that just have absolutely no shot. I mean, I'm not going to get excited about Finnick the Fierce. Uh, I know that's a horse near and dear to your heart, <laughs> Joe. But I thought that there's a couple sneaky horses. I came up with Sole Volante, Attachment Rate, and New York Traffic is my wise guy horses that might finish second. So instead of getting 380 on uh, Tis the Law, maybe I'll get a $30 exact, a $35 exact or something like that. I think they're all, uh, they're all horses. I use the thoroughbred sheets. They've all run fast enough in their history to be competitive. There'll be good prices. And uh, I just think it's such a crapshoot for the other race. Who's going to finish second, third, and fourth for the exactas, uh, tries, superfectas, and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and guys, you're bringing up some excellent points, um, you know, with regard to how the favorite's going to handle this and also, you know, what to expect in the race. Um, I don't want to, to, to uh, repeat some of the things that you guys are talking about, but let me talk about a couple of horses that I think, you know, are, are off the radar that have a shot. Um, Money Moves, which is a Todd Pletcher horse, a candy ride that they spent $975,000 for, uh, you know, won pretty impressively at, at its debut at Gulfstream, came back in a one turn mile and then had a break until July 25th, ran against all the horses and ran second and is improving dramatically um, with every race as, as it gets it under its belt. So Money Moves, who wouldn't even be in the Derby or the Preakness, you know, in previous years, all of a sudden is, is Pletcher's, uh, you know, opportunity at 30 to one. Um, I'm also really happy with the fact that I have not one, but two horses that are on my uh, fantasy list, Mr. Big News and Sol Volante, um, and really build a go to, to what you were saying. If you cross out Sol Volante's Belmont race, He's a really powerful horse and has a really good shot um, to hit the board. And then you have to look at a horse like Thousand Words, I think, who threw in a clunker um, in Oakland, came back and ran a good second in the Los Alamitos Derby, and then won a listed, granted it was a listed stake race when speed was, uh, you know, was, was really being favored at, uh, you know, out in California, but they paid a million dollars for him. He's really well bred. I think he's coming back into form at 15 to one, but there's no question in my mind that they're all running behind Tis the Law, um, who has just put in such a phenomenal, you know, three-year-old campaign. Now, could you say that he could bounce this race? Yeah, the sheet numbers and the buyer numbers and, you know, all the, all the uh, you know, the fancy logistics that you look at um, say that he will bounce probably. But could he bounce and still win? Yeah, absolutely. He's just that good. And against this field, which maybe isn't as good as the field that he would have run against, you know, had this race been uh, campaigned in May, um, yeah, he could still bounce and still run. Uh, well and, and probably win this race. So I'm excited about the Derby because it's the Derby. I'm excited about the Oaks because I think that's a great race also. But there's a dozen to 15 graded stake races, you know, running this weekend. And they, for the majority, they have really, really good deep uh, fields. And to me, as a fan of the industry, that's what I love about, about horse racing is all of these top races, all of the big money that's being thrown around, graded stake points and graded stake um, you know, uh, um, you know, badges that, that'll be earned, um, credentials that'll be earned over the next couple of weeks, that'll change the face of racing as well as breeding values. Um, to me, that's why it's so exciting. And then on top of that, I get to work with you guys. Oh, so wholesome. Mike drop. 
heartwarming. How, how do I follow that, John? Oh, come on, Alan Carlson. No idea. Um, I guess I'm going to weave a lot of what you guys um, said into my commentary here. I honestly, Joe, I, I, want, I want to say the pace is going to be genuine. It, I don't think it's going to be breakneck, but I think it's going to be a truly run race. I do think Authentic's got to go. Um, NY Traffic's going to go. Thousand Words looks like he wants to, to be there or thereabouts. So I think they, they can set a pace that's honest enough. And I, I don't know that the back markers will be um, unduly inconvenient. So just hope yet for Finnick, Joe, although he's got the rail. Tweeted this morning, this will be his 10th start. He's got the missing right eye, um, as or left eye as you look at him. It's the fourth time in 10 starts he's got the, the, the rail draw, which is quite remarkable, really. But um, I, I'm in the camp that it's an 18-horse field. I know Tis the law it has proven to be heads and shoulders above the, his peers to this point. I don't want a three to five shot in the derby. I'm probably playing honor AP to win. And unfortunately, the scratch of our collector means that uh, that honor AP starts at a price probably 40% less than what he might have been um, instead of eight to one. Now he's going to be something around five to one. Um, I, I think he should sit, he should be within striking distance. And I think he's one of these horses that has that real quiet, that Monarchos sort of derby burst in him if if they ride him to use it um i think it, if he's given the right ride and we can ask mike uh, mike smith later on if he's given the right ride i think he can accelerate i think he's got one of the best finishing punches in the race if they choose to ride him that way so for a long shot pick i'm i landed on sol volante as well i'm willing to forgive the belmont they said that he didn't handle the track he was off 10 days off of a really impressive one mile allowance at Gulfstream where he got back and, and ran on nicely. Um, if you can forgive him Belmont and uh, you know, three month layoff, I, I think he's a live chance to, you know, to run into the, into the numbers at, uh, at a big price. So those are my thoughts, y'all. Um, I think that thousand words and King Guillermo kind of make up the, the second, you know, echelon, of, of contenders, I think thousand words, you know, the share belief stakes was basically a graded stake in terms of who showed up and not having to beat honor AP that day Did get away with a pretty slow pace, but ran a one Oh four buyer other than tis the laws one Oh nine in the Travers. Like th that's the highest figure in the race. Uh, and King Guillermo is, is so interesting because, you know, he, he took, he purposefully took all this time off between the Arkansas Derby and the Kentucky Derby Got to Churchill early, has been working bullets there, worked in 58 and one, two works back for five furlongs. And a horse that, you know, it was a, seemed like a bit of a fluke when he won the Tampa, Tampa Bay Derby like he did. And then he came and backed it up in the Arkansas Derby. Um, I don't think he's going to be 20 to one, especially now with the scratch of our collector. I think he'll be closer to half of that. Same thing with Thousand Words. I don't know that he's quite going to be 15 to one, especially with that big scratch. But I like Finnick the Fierce. I, um, I'm willing to stick my neck out a little bit for him. I think he, you know, he was an ascending type when he ran third in the Arkansas Derby. He was only beaten a length and a half by King Guillermo. And then I think, I think his last two races are a little dirtied up. I think two back, he was in an optional claimer against Art Collector, was kind of forced out of his game, having to press Art Collector from the jump. He's more of a one-run type. And he ended up fading the third in that race. We've seen what Art Collector came back to do. And then the bluegrass, I thought he made a bit of an early move, early wide move, and then he faded to finish seven. Um, I don't think he's a particularly likely win candidate. I don't love the rail draw. Obviously, he could have some issues there. But he's not also, also not a total plotter. He's not a complete plotter like my uh, derby chase horse, Enforceable, who is just a deep plotter, one run kind of horse. I think Finnick the Fierce could be a little bit closer than people realize if he's able to navigate traffic on that on that clubhouse turn. Um Storm the court, I, I, I think his Ohio Derby was actually pretty good from that wide post running third. Uh, ran okay last time in, the, in his turf race in the, in the La Jolla. I don't think he's totally impossible. Major Fed has been working really well, seems to be sitting on the top effort. Um, who else? I like Attachment Rate, who Al has for the, for the fantasy contest. I thought he ran really well in the Ellis Park Derby, and I think he was a horse that 
you know, showed a lot early on with his big blowout maiden win and just, he ran okay in a couple of stakes, but it wasn't, he didn't, he didn't really jump forward the way he, he suggested he would, but I thought he ran really well in the Ellspock Derby. He really took it to our collector on the far turn and really ran flattened out a bit late, but I thought really ran almost every step of the way really hard there. Uh, New York traffic, not a huge price, but I think he could benefit from a fairly slow pace. Um, I, I think it's going to be moderate. I agree with Al. I, I mean, slow pace for the Derby is still like 48, 47 and change for the, for the half mile. So, you know, I don't obviously don't think they're going to go 50, like it's a New York turf race, but I think that, that it's going to be reasonable enough that the horses who are close to the pace are going to be at an advantage. And that includes the favorites, Tizzle and, and Authentic. And I don't think Connor AP is going to be that far out of it either. But I do think it's an interesting field in the lower rungs of the trifectas and superfectas. I think he got a chance to get some prices in there and get the exotics to pay, even if it chalks out like it look like, looks like it might. Any other thoughts from you guys? Yeah, uh, let's go back to the pace. Is if Authentic goes from the outside post, which we all think he's going to do, does he clear the field? Does he get two, three in front? And where does that put Tis the Law? I think Tis the Law. I mean, he, everything again just lines up perfectly for him. He looks like he could get a really good trip. I could see him stalking third. You know, just maybe two lengths off uh, Authentic, maybe even in fourth, something like that. But I would be curious to hear from everyone else. You know, where where Half mile into the race, where are where is authentic? Where is Tis the Law? Where are the other major players? I think the fact that that this race is devoid of speed um, has more to do with the top contenders that aren't here. You know, i.e. Nadal and Charlton that that showed so much speed. Where you know you have a bunch of horses that have tactical speed and can kind of sit off it. Um, where it, it it really lays it out, you know, for an opportunity like a front runner, like a thousand words. Um, to go out there and kind of slow the pace down. I think we can probably get ahead of myself, but we're going to be saying similar things about the Oaks as well with Gamine, where, you know, if they get in front and then slow it down, um, are they going to have enough left to, to kick at the end? And, and you know, that that's the big discussion and the $50 million question. Um, Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to discount Finnick the Fierce. I know I'm not going out on a huge limb saying a 50 to one shot doesn't have a chance to win, but really the only race that that horse ever won was going five eighths of a mile at Indiana um, back at its two year old year and has not crossed the wire first um, in, in eight other starts. So I, I know just what Joe's going to say. I have one more thing to, to say in defense of Finnick the fierce. He's one Go of ahead. only two horses to beat tis the law. Right. Okay. <laughs> he's also, he's also the only horse with one eye in the race. I mean, we can throw out crap all the, you know, that we want, but it's, I don't think, again, I'm not going on a limb at it saying a 50 to one shot doesn't have a chance. Yeah, who do you don't, like? Don't, don't, don't jump on my that. 50 to one shot. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to pick on you on that one, okay? Pick on the one-eyed horse. Okay. Um, but I love the fact that you like, you know, my horse, Sovalante, that has, that has a legitimate chance, um, as well as a couple of long shots. I really feel like that, that um, you know, one of the other horses that, that we're, we haven't spoken about yet that we probably should make mention of is um, is our friend, well, money, money moves, you know, that, that was the one that, that I brought up earlier on um, about how he's impressive and he's increasing his, his buyer numbers and sheet numbers and everything like that. What do you guys think? That's a 30 to one shot. What, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Is, is he just too unseasoned or uh, just not good enough? Cause he ran a 98 buyer. I know that's not the be all and end all, but he, that was an impressive uh, race last time out against older horses. Well, John, I'll bring up an obvious point about him, and I can see what you're saying, but this horse is making a stakes debut in the Kentucky Derby. You can only get that in this weird year, and uh, obviously he has zero points. I, you know, everybody has gotten away from the old-fashioned aspect of class handicapping because we're all slaves to the figures these days, the buyer numbers, et, et cetera. But, you know, let's just, you know, harken back to uh, – you know, when people used to consider those sort of things, can a horse literally be competitive, uh, be competitive in, a, in the Kentucky Derby after coming out of a first level allowance win and then second and a second level allowance win and has not, as I said, never even run in a stakes race before. And you only would get this in the 2020 Kentucky Derby. When it goes back, hopefully to normal, you never in a million years see a horse like this even make it into the field. Right. All, all I, good I, ones. I, I agree with all that. If I'm hearing you right, then you're saying that, that he's got a better chance than Finnick, right? <laughs> I think we've exhausted the Finnick, the fierce topic. We can, we can move on to others. Go ahead, Al. You're, you're up. 
I can't wait till until he wins and he becomes the new Harvey <laughs> Boyle of the CDN writers room. Listen, I've done so well with my with my picks for the stable that uh, the, you know the owners and, and trainer of Finnick the Fear should be jumping up and down knowing that I'm off their bandwagon. Don't worry, we'll get to that. I think Al wanted to say something. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I know that horses like um, Dale Romans and Dallas Stewart have had horses run into the into the top three at giant numbers, and so horses like uh, attachment rate and winning impression are in this race. As a rule, these afterthought sort of horses winning impression, um, I guess not attachment rate so much, but Necker Island, South Bend, money moves. I, 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 they're the first horses that I, that I toss. Um, somebody told me last night to toss Dallas Stewart at, in races like this and the Oaks is, um, is dangerous business. But um, I want to make one comment about a thousand words. He's in my stable and I just don't like him. Um, I, like, he served his purpose for me. He beat Honor AP. But, I mean, let's take it and keep it in some perspective. The shared belief was clearly a means to an end for Honor AP. Um, it was a strangely run race. Like, Thousand Words looked like he was going to get swallowed up at some point and then just kept sticking on. I mean, that whole field, um, including Cezanne, who runs in, in the Pat Day Mile, um, that whole field was covered by, what, a length and a half or two lengths at, at the wire. So it's a hard – I mean, I know it graded out strongly it's a race that i really don't know what to do with and i'd much rather have honor ap out of there than than thousand words i don't know how much further he wants i mean he's, he's bred to go on but just looking at him the way he runs um i'm just not sure that that he's built to stick around for that final for long on uh, on saturday so just a couple of thoughts and none of, and none of us have even talked about the backward horse authentic yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that's another one of Al's big hopes that he doesn't like. <laughs> that's, um, I don't know what to do. Like honestly, like he's um, it, it, his work the other day, it, it looked good. He was uh, twelve and two for six furlongs out seven and one twenty four. So I mean, he finished up running. Like for me, the gallop out was was the best part of it. Um, still, to me, like as soon as he breaks off, he does one of these. And he's just, he's just not a finished product yet. Um, he's a May 5th full. So he just hasn't put it all together yet. I mean, when he does, if he does, look out. Um, like, I want, a, I want a future bet on, on the Malibu Stakes. He's my Malibu Stakes winner. I don't know if he, he runs. He's always into the bridle. He's always into the bit. He goes hard. And to me, that, like, that makes me wonder if he's going to see out the distance as well he's going to be ridden away from there he's going to have some company and then let's see if he's good enough to stay i'm like i'm not gonna pay to find out alan i agree he's the good horse that nobody likes and you know never had a horse won a grade one one million dollar race and got so little credit for it uh than, than his haskell win because of the way he finished and the way new york traffic was coming at him and you know i'm i'm on the, of the same uh wavelength you know if i'm playing the uh, exactas and tries and everything he's not even on my tickets let him beat me in there but you can see why people don't like him um you know he's got the baffert mojo he is a grade one winner but you know if the race were a mile and a 16th I think I would have to to take him very seriously but I can't at a mile and a quarter and I think I'm, I'm just stating the obvious I, I think everybody has come up with pretty much the same conclusion I mean I can't toss him completely just because I like I said I don't think the pace is going to be super fast so I think he's going to be able to stick around I agree that I don't particularly like him as a win candidate it's interesting the way Baffert has worked him it's been a bunch of six furlong works and a mile he worked him a mile on August 25th at Del Mar so that suggests to me that he's not completely convinced he wants to go on a mile and a quarter either. And he's trying to put as much foundation into him as, as he can with the works. I agree. It's the first horse who's ever won a grade one million dollar race and had his stock downgraded. Uh, but he's just, he seems, he seems a little nuts. He seems still a little bit, a little bit crazy. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did something silly um, in the final furlong there. Uh, but that's, I, I wanted to just quickly segue into, into our fantasy stable before we move on. It's a, uh, I would say that Bill and, and and John are out of it, but I think the other three of us could all potentially win. Uh, I look to have a stranglehold on it with Tiz the Law and Art Collector. With Art Collector out now, I think that it's a little bit more open. Uh, the Derby, uh, the winning point total is 300 for the Derby if your horse wins. So um, 
Al and Brian are at least, you know, within shouting distance. And if Tizzle doesn't run well, Al's got authentic, he's got King Guillermo and he's got attachment rate and thousand words. So I think Al should get, should, should get props for getting four horses to the Derby. He should get some kind of bonus for that because that was, that, that wasn't easy to do. Like I only have, I only have two. I have Tizzle and enforceable. John has one. No, he has two. Cause <laughs> Mr. Big news was a late, late addition. Uh, big shout out there. Um, <laughs> Bill has one in, in New York traffic and uh, Brian has three. Brian has three. He's got honor AP max player and then a late edition money moves got into the gate. That was his supplemental pick, which would be hilarious if Brian ends up winning with his supplemental pick with all the railing he did against oh, the supplemental like draft, all the complaining. That would be, that would be pretty funny. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like still, I'm, I'm probably like his law, probably like three to five, four to five, but. You know, it's 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 definitely not impossible for me to be overtaken. So it'll be interesting to see um, if those guys can get the the W and Tizzle runs into a roadblock. But it's been fun. It's been a good idea to do the Derby this this little Derby fantasy contest. Definitely spiced up the uh, the conversation in these. You know, this wait has been longer than the Crimean War to get to the Derby. So you know, it was a good idea by Brian and and, and thanks to Patty and everybody for for uh, setting it up and keeping current with it. Um, so we touched on the Oaks last week, but now that we have the draw, I think we, sh- we should run it down a little bit more because it is such a phenomenal race with a couple of really, really superstar potential fillies. Um, definitely not, n- not the, uh, the lower, uh, not lower on the marquee for me this year. Um, with it, the Oaks is usually the opening act to the Derby. I think this year they're, they have dual top billing um, in, in Louisville. Obviously Gamine is, is the, Horse to beat. She's the fastest horse in the race. Uh, she's got questions about going a mile and an eighth, at least somewhat. Um, but I think she's if she if she runs her race, if she's able to relax on the lead, I think it's going to be hard for, her, for for them to beat her. But you know, this is in another in another world and another Kentucky Oaks. I feel like Gamine would probably be about one to five in this race. But this year with the competition, I don't think that that's going to be the case. I think she'll probably be three to five, four to five. Swiss skydiver is eight to five on the morning line. Second choice drew the one hole, which makes things interesting from a tactical standpoint. Uh, Ken McPeak said that he's, you know, he's going to tell Tyler to send from the rail and, you know, maybe, maybe we could get a hookup early between her and Gamine and they kind of just go one, two the entire race. I feel like that's, Definitely possible. Speech is the clear third choice at five to one. Uh, see if she can run back to her Ashland. I think this is a, a significantly tougher field than the Ashland was. Um, and she's she's got that one big race. She did run Gamin to within a neck in that optional claimer at, o- at Oaklawn. So she's got that mark for her. And, you know, that was Gamin's only two turn tries so far. So who knows what that means in terms of their their compete level at this point in the Oaks? I think Amin's gotten significantly better, but we'll see by how much. Um, beyond that, I think Donna Veloce is a little bit interesting. She's fifteen to one in the morning line. I don't know if she's going to be quite that high, but I think she should be 10, 12 to one range. I think talent wise, she she was right there with her, the top of her class earlier in the year, and you know she obviously has had a lot of time off. She hasn't run since the Santa Isabel March eighth at Santa Anita, but, um, if she has developed in that time, and I think Simon Callahan's a sharp guy and he wouldn't be running her in this race if she didn't think that she, you know, has risen to the level of at least, um, some of the second tier contenders here. I think she's really interesting. She's got a lot of experience going two turns. Um, so talent wise, I think she's, she's got a shot if she has developed in the, in the, uh, off time seems to have been working well at Del Mar. I worked six furlongs and one eleven and three there the other day. Um, so beyond that, I think it's a lot of, a lot of filler, a lot of long shots that, you know, don't really measure up to the, the top contenders, especially Gamine. But the race to me is all about Gamine and whether or not she's good enough going a mile and an eighth to do what she did in the test and in the acorn. Cause if she does that, it's, it's over lights out for everybody else, but it's at least a question, especially if Swiss guy ever takes it to her early uh, some final thoughts on the Oaks for you guys. Now that we have the post positions. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it is a more interesting race than the Kentucky Derby. I mean, you can't ever, ever say anything tops the Kentucky Derby, but if you just want to say what is the most interesting race, what is the most, you know, fascinating, compelling race, it, it's certainly the Oaks because of these two great horses that, that are going in there. Uh, a couple observations, and Joe, you touched up, uh, upon this, but I, I want to add to it. I think Tyler Gaffleone 
is in a really interesting position with Swiss Skydiver. You know, what do they do here? We know that Gamine is going to go for the front. Do they go after her early and really take it? I mean, literally like a, a quarter mile into the race and say, we're not going to let you get out there and get away from us. And we're going to take it right to you. And then if that's the case, do they go some impossibly fast pace? I think even if they did, I think that the, they're so much better to me than, well, maybe not. Speech and Donna Bellocchio, you're right, really are two very good fillies. But I could see them still, you know, running one, two because of their superior order there. Or does he decide to let Gamine get out there by two or three lengths and just try to, to make his run at her uh, when he gets a chance and not uh, take any risk of going too hard early? And now here's my, in the just whacked out fantasy world, let me f throw this out there and see what everyone thinks about this. On Friday, Gamine wins the Kentucky Oaks by eight lengths, you know, fabulous, unbelievable race again on Saturday tis the law wins the Kentucky Derby you know goes out and does his job Gamin versus tis the law in the pre mistakes how do you like that wow. not impossible not not impossible you're right and, and you can connect the dots and and say that that would that would be a really really interesting matchup especially because so many horses would fall out so fall off after the derby where they wouldn't even go to the to the preakness that would be a really really interesting race but gamin has got one hurdle ahead of her first and that's uh, swiss skydiver and and you know swiss skydiver is the filly that that i've been watching and saying this is just too, you know every race is too tough of an ask I mean, she's run nine times and she's run at eight different racetracks. And it wasn't like she was running at Monmouth and then Parks and then uh, Delaware, where it's all in the same area. She went from Churchill Downs to Tampa, from Tampa to the fairgrounds, from, from Louisiana back to, to Miami, then to Oakland, then across country to Santa Anita. Then, oh, by the way, let's bring her back to Keeneland and run her against the boys in the bluegrass um, in a full field and then run her a mile and a quarter in the Alabama up at Saratoga. And every single race that she's run, you know, save, you know, one, maybe the Rachel Alexandra, you would say, wow, she is just an unbelievably, you know, phenomenal filly to, to, to watch. Because I have a tough ask next to everything. Eight tracks at, at nine different races, uh, you know, nine different races, a number of different riders, a number of different track surfaces as far as the consistency of the, of the racetrack across the country. She was a modest $35,000 purchase at Keeneland September versus some of these really, really well-bred fillies uh, that, that sold for a lot more money. So, you know, McPeak obviously knows his filly very, very well. He knows where he can challenge her and what she can do. And the fact that she's gone, uh, and Bill, I'm going to steal a line from you from last show, where she's turning back from a mile and a quarter to a mile and an eighth versus Gamine, who's going from seven furlongs to nine furlongs, and that may be at the edge of, you know, where Gamine, uh, Gamine's ability can, can take her. Um, that being said, you know, Gamine's got so much speed. She's going to be the only filly in the race that can go, you know, 109 and still have something left, hopefully, at the end. So it, it's just a phenomenal David and Goliath type of, of race. Um, and, and not taking anything away from a couple of the other horses that we mentioned, Donna Veloce and Speech and, and, and a couple others. Um, she Dares the Devil, who we haven't even mentioned yet, but also is, is uh, an impressive filly in her own right. Um, you know, this really comes down to almost a match race for those two. And you could say either one of them, if they won, would be a challenge for Tis the Law, maybe in the uh, in the Preakness. So it just lines up where it, it, it's going to be a, kind of a match race coming up this week. And then about a month from now, maybe an even better match race uh, against the boys. Hmm. So, uh, Bill, I think it's possible. Um, owner Michael Lund Peterson is a Maryland guy, bought the Philly at the Maryland sale. Um, so I think there's every chance that if she runs – that way that she'll get that chance. So that would be, that would definitely add some excitement to the triple crown. Um, nobody's really given speech the just do that. I think she deserves. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with her Ashland. Um, you know, she wasn't the match for Swiss skydiver uh, at Santa Anita, but I think she's an improving Philly. Um, and I am of the opinion that, um, Bill, to answer your question, I think the right idea would be to take a little bit of a hold from her, let her break, take a little bit of a hold of her and get her outside of Gamine and then hope that she's got the better stamina. Um, I would think that would be their strategy. I think speech sits within shouting distance of those two and then tries to outstay them. Um, you know, at five to one, I think she's she's definitely bettable. I think she's deserving of being in the wind discussion. So um, 
And what about the possibility that Donna Beloche, if she's out there working um, three quarters of a mile and she's going to be fresh, um, couldn't she be part of the pace? I mean, I, I think there's there's that possibility as well. So so maybe the maybe the pace could be extra hot. Yeah, I think I definitely think we'll see a, a quicker pace. Uh, relative to the par in the Oaks uh, rather than the Derby. Um, I think I agree with the David and Goliath metaphor, especially since Gamin costs $1.8 million and Swiss Skydiver costs $35,000. I think that's, that's a really interesting uh, way to look at it. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, Gamin is too fast on her best day. So that's, that's to me what the race is about and whether or not her best day is going to be at nine furlongs or not is the question. As far as the Preakness goes, like what if she runs and, and crushes them on, on Friday? Why not? You know, what else is there? Unless you want to, you know, sit her down until the distaff, what else is there for her to run in? I mean, the Zenyatta at Santa Anita, like who cares? Nobody cares if you win that race. I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's a grade one, but she's already a grade one winner, multiple grade one winners. So why not? Why not take a shot against the boys, especially if she shows that kind of rocket ship speed and is not you know, they don't even come close to catching her in the Oaks. Why don't you, why wouldn't you think that she could go go out to the front and do the same thing in the Preakness and make Tizzle chase her? Obviously we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but I think that it is a really interesting potential matchup. And if she does blow them out in the Oaks on Saturday, I don't see why, or Friday, why, I don't see why not, why not, why not go after the boys next? We'll see what happens. Terrific race, really exciting cards, Friday and Saturday up and down. Waited a long time for the Oaks and the Derby to come around. It's finally here. And uh, it even put a smile on Grinchy John Green's face. So what more could we ask for? We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Multiple-graded stakes-winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. So West Point will be represented on Derby Day in the Derby with winning impression for Dallas Stewart. Obviously, they've had uh, long shots run well for Dallas Stewart with like commanding curve in the past and always dreaming won it a couple of years ago. So we're glad that the partners are going to get to experience Derby Day, even if it's not in person, even if it's not the same as it usually would be. There's nothing like having a starter in the Kentucky Derby, I assume. I could never know that. But <laughs> we're happy and excited for the, for the guys and gals at West Point. And hopefully he can outrun his odds and really threaten like we've seen them do in the past. So good luck to all of you at West Point in the Derby. So earlier this week, we had some pretty big news uh, on the regulatory front in racing. Um, we had the introduction of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act. Um, into, oh, it's going to be introduced into the Senate by Mitch McConnell, which he's I hear he's a pretty big deal in the, in the Senate and Congress. Uh, not too familiar with the guy, but he's from Kentucky, I believe. Um, so it's obviously a, a big thing to have his push behind it. He is the Senate Majority Leader. Uh, they're also the, the so the backers of the bill spoke Monday of quote newfound compromise and consensus among the sports stakeholders um, to help usher in that bill. And it, they also outlined how a nine-member oversight board known as the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority uh, would craft the new program and how that authority would contract with the United States Anti-Doping Agency, otherwise known as USADA, to manage and administer the new set of rules. Um, it says a fresh component would also cover racetrack safety standards, and that'll also be written into McConnell's new version of the bill. This is from TD's Thor TD Thornton's reporting in the TDN. Um, I wanted, just wanted to quote the Churchill Downs Chief Executive, Bill Karstenian. I hope I'm getting that name correct. Karstenian. Uh, Karstangen. Okay, thank you. Um, he says the crux of the bill is that this new entity, the authority, capital A, will have jurisdiction over the, the design, implementation, and enforcement of anti-doping and medication controls, as well as racetrack safety protocols. 
Um, it says with, with respect to the anti-doping and medication control program, the authority will contract with USADA, which I already said, for their services and managing and administering the program developed by the authority. It says the authority may also contract with state racing commissions, as it makes sense both with respect to the medication and control program and race track safety program. So it was kind of low on specifics. Um, I'm going to defer to Bill on a lot of this. Uh, it seems like it has the backing of the majority of the industry. Um, but the, the nine member oversight panel is going to be mostly, um, from people outside the industry. Uh, it's going to be an independent board. Um, it says it's going to be supported by two substantive standing committees, one for medication, anti-doping, one for track safety. A third standing committee will evolve out of the blue ribbon panel, blah, 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 blah. So it seems like a lot, a lot of words and not too many commitments on what's going to happen, what we're going to do. I will say that any kind of compromise and uh, coordination and cooperation across the sport is a good thing. That's something we lament all the time. But we had something like this recently with the Racetrack Safety Alliance, and I'm not sure how many reforms have definitively come out of that. Uh, so I think that you know, while I applaud any movement towards uniformity, I think definitely getting USADA involved is a very good thing. Uh, we need some outside help when it comes to regulating medication in our sport. Obviously, um, I just I would wait to see what kind of specifics come out of this. It is a big deal, though, I think mainly because Mitch McConnell is behind it. And now it has a legitimate chance to pass the Senate. Uh, Bill, I'll toss it to you first. Yeah, a couple of things. And you throw out a lot there, Joe. First of all, from people who that know a lot more about this than I do say that this is going to happen. And the reason why is McConnell has a track record of not uh, bringing up legislation when he when he doesn't know that it's a sure thing, that he's not going to have look bad with egg all over his face and bring up legislation, and not have it go. And in this you know highly polarized world that we live in right now, this is the ultimate bipartisan issue. I mean, you know, Democrats like horses, Republicans like horses, people in red states like horses, people in blue states like horses, and want good things to happen for horses. So I am very optimistic that this is going to happen and we are going to have this new, you know, alphabet organization, et cetera. And I understand your skepticism. This is the 843rd, you know, alphabet organization that will be out there and come up with. And you're also right about something else. We need to learn a lot more about this for the specifics about, you know, things like Again, questions people raise, how is it going to be paid for? Is LASIK going to be okay? Is LASIK not going to be okay? Um, that sort of thing. But to me, what this all comes down to, and reason why I think this is a really good thing for horse racing, and look, you know, they're all they're going to have uniformity. So you have the same butte withdrawal rules in Delaware that you have in Arizona. Who cares? Nobody cares. But that, you know, that that's one of the things that they're touting. To me, this is all about USADA. And what I wrote, and we go back to Jason Service and Jorge Navarro. And if anybody out there thought that horse racing was doing a good job dealing with cheating, well, how could you possibly think that after Navarro service and the indictments? You know, we, they, the sport has had a 200 years to try to work on this problem and fix it, and they can't do it. And it took the federal government to come in and do their dirty work for them. And as I've said a couple of times in this podcast, federal government is going to go away and racing is going to be left to its own devices. USADA is an organization that knows what they're doing. They got Lance Armstrong, they've kept the Olympics clean. The sport of horse racing will be a lot better off and a lot cleaner when you know the new sheriff in town comes in, Travis Tiger and his boys, and they're out there trying to catch these guys and they're out there doing everything that we think that should be done to clean up the sport. So of the, the dozen or so aspects that this bill has brought up and the things that it's going to cover, to me, I don't care about 11. I care about 12. I care about USADA. I care about Travis Tiger. And I think anybody uh, who has been preaching like we have for almost a year now about the need to clean up this sport should be very happy that it looks like this major step is likely to happen now. Yeah, and quite simply, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited today also is that we've been we've been begging and canvassing for some kind of uniform set of rules, but more importantly, for an organization to be overseeing the testing and enforcing the rules um, and the penalties that, that come up with people who cheat. I mean, you know, people have, have, have been listening to our podcast for a year and they've heard, heard us bang the table, you know, really since March, um, that we need uniformity and that the industry as a whole wants to have some kind of set of rules and an organization to oversee it. And then most importantly, to have 
a bite in the penalties um, if somebody fails, you know, to uh, to abide by the rules. Um, so this is a great step. The fact that you have the organizations behind it is fantastic. The fact that you have, like Bill said, um, you know, you have a very strong person in, in D.C. and who resides in Kentucky and understands the importance of the industry to the Kentucky residents and his constituents. It's just all falling together. And um, Bill, like you said, it took us two centuries as an industry to get to this point, and it took the government and the powers that be six months, really, to come up with, with a solution. And hopefully this one is going to catch and this one is going to, um, you know, take hold and be a part of the fabric of the industry um, that really needs to have this kind of, uh, of an oversight committee um, and rules and regulations and an authority to actually follow through with it. So I couldn't be happier about it. And I think as important as it is for horse racing insiders to know that this can be or might be coming, like it's equally important for those on the outside. And we've been talking for months and months about the public perception of, of horse racing. And if the public sees governmental or federal intervention at, at that sort of level, and if the program yields results, gives something to people to latch onto that, hey, these guys are really on the job, they're, they're doing the job and, and they're weeding out the, the bad stuff. So I think that can only be a good thing. I mean, I do think it's, you know, it's a great thing that uh, that Senator McConnell is behind it. Obviously that, that carries some weight. Andy Barr from Kentucky was, I uh, was on the stage as well. He's previously introduced legislation with his democratic counterpart, Paul Tonko in the house. And um, he spoke of, um, I don't know what the exact language was, but basically mirroring the bill in the House of Representatives that, that gets sent, sent to them from the Senate, which might um, streamline the, the passage of, of something like that. Nancy Pelosi is um, obviously across the aisle from, from Mitch McConnell, but, um, you know, Diane Feinstein also from California has, has been uh, vocal on the, on the Democratic side. But, I mean, you, you would have to believe that there would be bipartisan support for it, and why not, like Bill said, um, it's an issue that everybody can sort of get behind. So I think it's a step in the right direction. You know, let's see what happens in, in practice. Let's see how long it takes to implement. Let's see how they pay for it. But but on the surface, obviously, it's a good thing for, for the game. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with what you guys said and, and echo what Bill said about, you know, USADA being the most important part of it because racing is very good at creating boards, at creating panels, creating new alphabet organizations and has so far been very not good at actual enforcement. So I think that getting an outside end is, an entity, especially one with as much credibility as USADA is a big thing in terms of cleaning up our sport and how this thing is going to work. Uh, it, it's fortunate in this case that the Senate majority leader happens to be from the biggest horse industry state in the country. I think that that will really helped us out here in terms of getting this thing on eventually onto the Senate floor. Um, you know, I can't, I can't comment on the, the specifics of the bill because I haven't, you know, haven't delved into it that deeply. Um, but I, what Al said about Andy Barr and Paul Tonko, those guys have been pushing this for a long time. Um, so there's a lot of hard work in those two offices that have, have gotten this to this point. Um, and yeah, like, the main thing is to get the enforcement of medication rules outside of the hands of racing. And that's, it's like, you know, it's, it sounds like an indictment because it kind of is, but that's the main thing. And I think I'm, I'm glad that people in racing are, are have started to recognize that and realize that, you know, we, we're not good at, at policing ourselves. We're not good at, you know, uniformity and cooperation in general. I think it's getting better. But this is something that needs to be taken outside of the sport and be an independent enforcement agency. And I think that, you know, that's that's the key takeaway from this bill. And, you know, like Al said, who knows how long this is from passing? Who knows how long it is from being set up and implemented? Um, but it's it's a step in the right direction for sure. But uh, we're, we're going to have to wait for more specifics in terms of the actual the actual bill and, and its effects. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost they're trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds.
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is a major celebrity in the horse racing world. We are so excited to bring him on. Mike Smith, thank you for joining us, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Of course. Um, so you will be on Honor AP in the Derby in a couple of days. Um, you're, you're a past Derby winner, obviously with Justify and Giacomo, you know a lot about riding in this race. Wanted to ask about Honor AP first. Seems like a horse who has developed steadily over time, ran second last time in the shared belief. How have you seen him grow and what makes you think that he's about to run the best race of his life? Well, the, the shared belief was, uh, you know, I- after the Santa Anita Derby, uh, which was a mile and eighth, we shortened, we, their shared belief was a mile and 16th. So it shortened back up and he didn't get a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, serious training in between the two races. You know, they certainly wanted him to be peaking at, at this time, you know, and, and, and not then. So, you know, I think his best work going into that race was a 102 or something like that, very slow. So he kind of just run a little bit sluggishly and finally come running at the end. And actually, they still ran really well. He ran a 102 buyer, I believe, to run second. So that was good. But since then, we've really stepped up his training. We've really put some sharp works into him. And then uh, after his two really sharp works, we just did a kind of a maintenance work last time out. Man, he did it so nice. I think he went seven eighths of a mile in 27, 127 and galloped out in 40, which was really, really good. He did it all on his own. So he's coming into the to the derby training extremely well and, and really fine-tuned and, and, and fit to run his best effort. Hey, Mike, it's Bill Finley. Thanks for joining us. And um, even though you're not riding him, let's get your take on Authentic as well, because you did ride him up through his last race in the Haskell. And uh, a lot of people are are commenting on the fact that he still seems a little bit immature. He hasn't really figured the game out. And also a lot of people don't think he's necessarily uh, a mile and a quarter is a sweet spot for him. Again, understanding you're not riding him, but you certainly know a lot about him. Your take on him and if you could answer those uh, two particular questions about his perceived immaturity and his ability to go a mile and a quarter. Well, early on, I mean, he was, yeah, he used to look around a whole lot, Bill. He would kick away from his, his competition so easy, so talented. He's a very athletic horse, and he would kick away from so easy, and it kind of just leave him out there on his own, and he'd get to looking around a lot, which he did a little bit in the in the Haskell, but not, not as bad as he had done in the past. So he's certainly getting better about it. And then again, yeah, I mean, the distance would be the, the, the question with him. Uh, again, sometimes, you know, these horses, you, you think it's going to be a problem, and then they go out there on the lead, and they just keep on running. Uh, but he's he's got the he certainly has the talent. He deserves to be there. He's a very athletic horse. I, I see him if they want to be built. I see him on a, on the on the lead, probably on his own, especially with our collector out now. Uh, so hopefully he won't. You know he'll have some sort of company that 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 will keep him that keep the pace honest anyway. And then uh, I shouldn't be too far off of probably him. Uh, New York traffic and uh, and tis the law. So, Mike, when, when you handicap this race and you look at your horse in comparison to, to the other group, obviously it's a it's an unusual race in the sense that uh, there are so many participants in it. How do you, you know, when you close your eyes and, and think about the way that the perfect race would be for Honor AP, how would that set up for you? Is it having a couple of speed horses and you sit on the outside? Is it you tucking in on the rail and saving ground? Just give us an idea of what, like, the picture perfect race would be in your mind. Well, means I got the 16th hole. I mean, it would probably – had be a whole lot of work to try and get tucked in down on the rail. Uh, but the speed is to the outside. Hopefully they'll, they'll, you know, we'll all break well and break running and I can just kind of follow them on over and, and just hopefully have a clear trip on the outside of them. Uh, and that would be good for him because I, again, I, th- I think he's a horse that wants the distance, you know, uh, in his race going a mile and eighth. And when he trains in the morning, the best part of everything is at the very end. I mean, he's, he seems to just keep on going. So the mile and quarter should be right up his alley and I'm hoping I can, really get marching forward at the three and a half so that the quarter pole, I don't have a lot to make up and then uh, just see if he's good enough to run on by who's ever been fortunate enough to hit the front. Hey, Mike, it's Alan Carrasso. It's an honor to have you on with us. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Obviously you've ridden a derby winner before for John Sheriff's wrote a triple crown winner for Bob Baffert. How difficult at the end of the day was it for you to decide to ride honor AP over authentic? Uh, you know, they were, they're, they're one up. I mean, they're tied with each other. You know, the first time they ran against each other, uh, authentic, uh, beat on our AP. We had to come off a, a foot injury, 
had missed some time. So I knew he wasn't a hundred percent going into that race. Now in the San Anita Derby, I knew he was, and then, you know, the extra eighth of a mile, I uh, was really happy to, to, to see the way he ran. And, and I thought that the, the, the distance would really suit him well. Then I got the opportunity to ride authentic. And although he ran really good, he probably didn't run his a race uh, that day, but he still pulled it off. But again, I, I, you know, I just, truly think that that when we're going to go a mile eighth and further that's when you see honor ap really start to, to shine really start to stand out and uh and that's just what made my mind up i, I think he'll get the distance i think the mile and quarters again I'm, i can i can't wait to see what he does uh, going a mile and quarter i wanted to ask you about your, your previous derby wednesday we came from him with very different circumstances i remember with giacomo i remember you saying early in his career that he reminded you of holy bull and he kind of had fallen off a little bit for a while there and then shocked everybody at 50 to one. And then Justify was a much shorter price. He was much more heralded coming into the Derby. Can you reflect on those two rides and maybe the kind of different pressure you felt and the different feelings you got after winning? Well, with, with Giacomo, I mean, uh, you know, he, he looked like a lot like his dad. He didn't have the same running style and, and, he, and he wanted good, as good as horses his father was as far as a racehorse uh, was, was, but he was, uh, he was a horse that was, you know, we were running out west where the tracks were really fast at the time. Uh, they weren't suiting him, but he was still running extremely well in all the preps. He would run second or third, really gallop out strong. So I knew that once we got off the, the West Coast racetracks and once we got to go a little further, he was going to he was going to excel. He was going to run better. Was it going to be good enough for him to uh, to win the Derby? I wasn't really sure, but I was talking myself into it. You know, I'd ridden his father in the Derby and he was a big favorite and and he probably ran probably his worst race that he actually ran, uh, was in the Derby. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to redeem his father's name, so to say, you know, so I was kind of using that for, 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 to keep me pumped up and keep me excited about it all. And, and then the more I, I looked at the race and especially after it, they drew it, I saw that, that man, this pace is going to be really hot. And then the horses that, that, that set off the pace were, if, if, if that pace could drag him into it a little bit, this could really set up for me. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so we were 50 to one. We didn't have a whole lot of pressure on us going into that one. Uh, now going into, you know, when, when I was with Justify, it was a whole different story. I mean, we had all the hype. He was the horse to beat. Uh, we actually believed that he had the kind of talent that could pull off uh, a triple crown uh, kind of thing. If, if we were blessed enough to, you know, of course, win the first, you know, first one, then on to the second and on to the last. But he was that kind of horse. So there was a whole lot more pressure with him. Now going in this year with the Honor AP, again, I, this is a horse that I think has a le legitimate chance. Uh, I mean, we all saw Tiz Law's last race, but that doesn't mean they're always going to come back and run that same kind of race. And, and, you know, I think that if I'm within a length or two of them heading for home, I'm not without a big chance to maybe run them all down, run them all down. Mike, uh, since we brought it up, I want to go back to Holy Bull. And he was terrific before the Kentucky Derby. If memory serves me right, he won the Bluegrass. He was terrific after the Kentucky Derby, won the Met Mile. He was one of, probably one of the two or three most talented horses you've ever ridden. He didn't run a step, not one no. step in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, out of the gate, he didn't show any speed. Is it just one of those things? Or do you, all these years later, do you have any theories why that is? You know, Bill... I, I honestly don't think he cared for Churchill that much. Uh, when I go back and really think about it and look at it, they breezed him three eighths of a mile. He was over at Kingman training. He was working dynamite and they came over to just to, to blow him out a, a three eighths of a mile. And he went like, and it was unbelievably slow. I mean, you couldn't get Holy Bull to go backwards that slow. I think it was like a 39 or something like that for three eighths. It was like, he didn't even, he didn't even work good over it, which was, which was strange. And he, and that's just kind of the way he was uh, in the post parade and, and in the gate, he was just, nothing was there. He just went one, one, you know, I was, I was more worried. I thought the only thing could get me beat is if I fell off him in the post parade, because he was pretty aggressive in the post parade. He'd play a lot and rear up and all this crazy stuff. And he did none of that that day and, and, and ran that way. He just ran very, very flat. Mike, since we're going back in some of the, the best horses you've ever ridden, when Bob Bafford was on the show a couple of months ago, um, you know, we asked him out of all the horses you've trained, who was the, the best horse you ever had? And he didn't give us the best horse, but he said, you know, the best races that I've ever trained a horse from or I've ever seen a horse compete in was Arrogate, which obviously you were a big part of. Um, oh, yeah. and, and he mentioned, you know, going from the Travers to the Breeders' Cup Classic to the Pegasus World Cup. Um, to the Dubai World Cup and just said that those races back to back to back to back were just, you know, off the charts. 
walk us through a little bit on the the top money earner that that's ever uh, graced this earth. You know, at at a at a mile and a quarter, man, just all out. Probably of all of them that I've ever been blessed enough to have ridden. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I think even the numbers show that that Arrogate was probably the fastest. Uh, he was just a, a just a cool horse to ride. Great to be. He had a high cruising speed, uh, and he had stamina that just never stopped. I mean, he just seemed to go faster and faster and faster. I remember the Travers, uh, and we had it. We were running pretty pretty quick, and we headed for home. And I asked him to run, and he just picked it up like it was nothing, and just continued on. It was pretty incredible. You know, and to come back and see him break the track record and run a mile and a quarter in under two minutes was was unbelievable. And then he went into the into the Breeders' Cup uh, and was able to to run down California Chrome and, and uh, at, at a, you know California Chrome that that they probably got a pretty soft pace. I mean, he went pretty easy up front, and I thought he was going to be very difficult to run down. And for him to run him down, I thought it was incredible. Go on into the Pegasus, he. We probably pretty much use that as a <laughs> he kind of used that as a as a work to get into the to the, the World Cup. He won so easy in the Pegasus, uh, and he needed every bit of that because uh, as you remember, we're watching the World Cup. He, he gets away slow. They squeeze him out of the gate. Uh, I got absolutely no chance. I'm dead last. I'm supposed to be you know laying at least second, maybe third, to, you know at worst. And here I am, let dead last, about 15 behind the field, and and for him to. To, to just creep back into that race and then finish the way he did and then beat a horse like Gunrunner and doing it was uh, was the ultimate. Uh, the only bad thing was after that, uh, we came to Delmore and Delmore was a place he just never really cared for. The tracks at the time, uh, especially still, actually, that were very, very deep, uh, deep, deep racetracks. It seemed like the stronger you are, that the deeper you go into the ground. And, and he just never cared for that track. Even before the Travers, you know, he won... Uh, a little prep race before the Travers uh, there at Saratoga. It's a three-horse field, and he won, but he just did win. Mm-hmm. I mean, the horse that he beat that day actually didn't win a race again until Los Al for claiming eight. You know, wow. So that's how much he hated Delmar. But you get him off of Delmar, man, and he's never beat. Mike, one thing I marvel about your career is the number of Hall of Fame disc staffers that you've sat on. Um, Azari, Inside Information, Songbird, obviously Zenyatta. Um, I mean, Ibizu probably isn't quite in that same discussion, but obviously a really nice uh, race mare. Um, you've been away from her now for a couple of times. Can you talk to us about how that's been missing the last couple of rides on her and and what is the outlook for uh, for this year's distap? Will you be able to ride her this year? Uh, yeah, first of all, yeah, I really missed her. Uh, you know, we didn't get a chance to, you know, as you well know, I, I traveled quite a bit and with all these, you know, protocols and not being able to go into, into Saratoga really, really kind of messed my summer up, crushed my summer up pretty good, to be honest with you. But, uh, uh yeah, I've been blessed every time I, I, you know, every time I get a ride with one of these mares and I think, well, that's, that's the end of that. I'll never get another one like that one. Well, then here comes another one and here comes another one. Then here comes one like, you know, uh, Zenyatta, who's probably the greatest mayor of all times. Uh, and then after her, you know, I was even blessed with Songbird and, and Unique Bella. And then along comes uh, Midnight Bizu. Uh, and finally, I, I do get to get, get back on her. I saw the protocols in Kingman. So you get to fly in. You just got to get in and take a t- test uh, before you ride and, and clear a test. And that's pretty much it there. So I'm going to get to ride her back. She's going to run there on the October I think it's the second. I'm not. I'm not positive, but I think it's October second. But uh, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited, excited to get reunited with her. I just wanted to ask about your riding style because you're known as a big money race rider. You don't ride the quantity of horses that some other guys do. But I think you know if you want a guy to win a big race, you're one of the top two or three guys most people would pick. And just from an outsider layman's perspective, you seem to be a very calm guy during the race. You don't seem to ever panic. You have a laid back personality too, honestly. So it, it makes sense in that way. But, you know, where does that kind of come from that kind of calm when all the eyes are on you usually as a big favorite, how do you, how do you stay relaxed and how do you stay even during these big races? Well, I'm, I'm certainly calm, uh, but inside I, if I, I'd be lying to you if I told you I wasn't, I wasn't nervous. I, I, if you ain't nervous, then you're not up for the, up for the race or up for the game that you got. It's just how you use that energy, you know, and I, I've just learned to slow it down. I think just with, you know, getting the opportunity to ride with great riders and learning from them and watching them and, and 
and knowing that panicking ain't, ain't going to help anything. You know, you get away, step slow, you wind up rushing into a fast pace or something like that. It's just learning to, to really get a horse into a rhythm. And once you get a good horse into a rhythm, it, you just point them in the right direction and they're going to run, you know? And, and so you get them into a good, comfortable rhythm. You give them a place to go when it's time, uh, you know, try and set up a, a good trip for them. And then and I, you pull the trigger and they're, they're going to, they're going to fire. Hey, Mike, um, you're doing what you're doing at an age 55 years old, where most jockeys have either retired or on the tail end of their career or not riding nearly as well or achieving what they did in their 40s. What is possible now? I mean, do you think about an end? Do you think about how much longer you want to go on? And what do you think will be the ultimate reason why you might say, OK, this is it. I am retiring. At times, you know, I think about, you know, retiring and well, but then I think, well, where else am I going to have this kind of fun? I mean, I'm actually having a blast right now, getting the opportunity to ride, you know, just in these big races. And, and if I did anything right early on in my career, Bill, I, I really took up physical fitness instead of, you know, you know, going out playing golf and not doing a whole lot. I mean, every morning I, I just made it a way of life. I, I literally I train every morning. If I'm not training myself, I have uh, two different personal trainers that train me uh, probably at least five times a week. And I go at it pretty, pretty hard. And I've been doing it for a long time and it's starting to pay off in my later years. I mean, I've, I'm every bit as fit uh, as far as my charts are going. I'm still as fit as I was 10 years ago. So for some reason, I'm hanging in there. And I, as long as I can continue to do that, I plan to ride another few years. If I start feeling that I'm not, I'm hurting them and I'm not helping them and, and I'm, you know, you can, you, you'll be able to see it out there. It, it just starts that whenever it starts, when I start embarrassing myself and I'm, I'm, I'll call it quits. Well, right. If you see me embarrass myself, you tell me. <laughs> I think you're a ways from that. I think you're all right for now. Mike, I just have one more question for you. Um, just because it, probably after this year, McKinsey's going to retire and, and stand at stud. Tell the audience about what you think about McKinsey and, and all the races that, that you've ridden. When, when you think of McKinsey, what's the, you know, what comes through your mind? You know, he's one of those throwbacks uh, of, of the old good horses, man. I mean, he, he can run, you know, three quarters of a mile and you can stretch him out the falling race point a mile and eight. You can back him back up to a mile. You can go ahead and try a mile and a quarter with him and, and he'll fire and run huge every time. I mean, he's a really, really, you know, talented horse. Uh, you know, early on in his three-year-old career, he got hurt a little bit and, and, and maybe never really got to be what he really could have been. But in saying that, he's still competing at the highest of levels and i wouldn't be surprised if if, uh, if he'll if he'll handle this uh if he'll come back i mean last year in this same race the alice he was uh he was amazing that day i think he set the track record that day but he really took to churchill downs he really liked it uh, so i'm hoping that's the case again and if that's the case he's gonna run big again on friday so they're they're excited about that then after that they'll we'll just they'll decide where they're gonna where they're gonna point him as far as breeders cup rather that be the mile or, or the or the classic all right, Mike, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Best of luck this weekend. Safe trip. And we hope to see you riding for a while. Because if you don't, then you could never come on an illustrious podcast like this one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Thanks, well, I appreciate it, man. It was great talking to you guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Thanks a lot this weekend. Thank you. Go get them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As the Green Group Guest of the Week, Mike Smith will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So Barkley Tag made some unfortunate news yesterday when he was doing a little bit of press for the Derby after just landing in Louisville. He was asked about the protests that are expected to happen all week. We've touched on it on the show before. Here's what he had to say. You know, we have we go back to the hotel. We have a driver who takes us back to the hotel and brings us here in the morning. and We train the horse. And, and I don't know. I don't know what these guys are going to do with these uh, riders. I don't Who knows? All I know is you're not allowed to shoot them and they're allowed to shoot you. That's what it looks like to me. So <laughs> I don't know what to think about it.
Um, so I thought those comments were incredibly disappointing and unnecessary and really kind of inflaming things for no reason. And it just goes to show you how pervasive and how dangerous the racial unrest and rhetoric, particularly on one side, is in this country right now. And Barclay, to me, seemed like he just couldn't help himself, probably because he's been riled up by the president. And I know people don't want to hear this, but you can draw a direct line in my eyes from Trump saying when the looting starts, the shooting starts to one of his diehard supporters murdering two people last week in the street and his refusal, his refusal to condemn it. And it's just insane on its face. First of all, it serves no purpose but to inflame. But that's where we are. And it's where we are as a society. And it's also where we are as an industry. And it's Kentucky Derby week. And the trainer of the favorite is lamenting the fact that, quote, you can't shoot them one week after a right wing militant killed two of them in the street. And this will now be one of the major stories that overwhelms what should be a week of celebration for our sport just when racing is starting to finally recover from the PR nightmare surrounding last year's breakdowns at Santa Anita. So we appreciate that, Barkley. Thanks for that. And, you know, I think the bigger the bigger implication here is you wonder why there's no diversity in racing. And we were hesitant to talk about it as four white guys recently, but I feel pretty comfortable saying that people like Barkley Tag are one of the main reasons why there's no diversity in racing. To pretend that there isn't this substantial amount of generational hostility to diversi diversifying our sport is absurd to me. And I think the situation is improving, but when the trainer of the Kentucky Derby favorite, unprovoked, equates protesters, the majority of which are black, and vast majority of which are 100% peaceful, to rioters who he complains that he can't shoot, why would a person of color ever think, that's an industry that would welcome me? And it's especially contradictory when this year, for the first time in 13 years, we, we have black owners of a derby horse. Necker Island has two African-American owners, and those owners support the Black Lives Matter movement. And this is what they have to put up with in horse racing in 2020. So I just, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't necessary. And it just, it, it shows how much work we have to do in this sport to get rid of this racist underbelly that people don't want to exist, but really does exist. And I think Barkley let everybody down. And it's unfortunate because otherwise Tis the Law is a very, you know, likable horse, New York bred, Sacatoga stable. Jack Knowlton's always been good with us and with the media. And there's really no reason for me to root against him. But now I'm going to be kind of grossed out, honestly, if he wins on Saturday. And it's just, it was, it was disgusting. And it was, it was unnecessary, uncalled for. And it, it really is a reflection of where we are as a society as an, and as an industry. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, Keeneland September starts September 13th. That's next Sunday. Uh, all the action will be streamed on the TDN website and on Keeneland.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Mike Smith, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Danny, Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great blast of a derby weekend. We will see you next week and wear a mask.